I thought I'd do is uh, touch uh, briefly on a number of the topics uh, in my uh, career so far. So I'll talk for about 15 minutes on uh, some highlights from work I've done in the Caribbean on the Nolus lizards, then about 15 minutes on um, work on, in the Rocky Intertidal of California, and then about 15 minutes on what on the research that I'm currently doing, um, applying economic theory to understanding the evolution of the Social, social groups. Now the work that we did in the Caribbean uh, was in the Eastern Caribbean, and this is a picture of an anole. Um, so this is Anolus gingivinus from uh, the, the from the island of Anguilla. The Caribbean out here uh, consists of an island arc. The Eastern Caribbean consists of an island arc, which is at the edge of the Caribbean plate. So the Caribbean plate was at one time, relative to us, in the, in, out here in the Pacific Ocean. And then as, uh, and, uh, as North and South America moved westward and sort of pulled apart from one another, basically the, uh, it looks relative to someone standing on North America or standing on South America. It appears as though the Caribbean plate came in through between North and South America. And it first headed up in this direction, so you find the greater Antilles uh, uh, being formed at the edge of the Caribbean plate as it moved north. Then for some reason it changed and moved east, and so you get the lesser Antilles out here as an island arc at the edge of the Caribbean plate relatively recently. Now unlike the islands here in Hawaii, these things are really old. So in this vicinity over here where Guadalupe is, there's actually Jurassic basement you can go to near the island of Marie Gallant and, um, and Le Desirat and actually see exposed basement that's uh, from the age of dinosaurs. And there's Cretaceous uh, material uh, exposed off of Puerto Rico here. <clears throat> so these islands uh, have a long history to them. And as a result of that, there's an, an impact of uh, plate tectonic motion on the distribution of lizards. And so it's not purely an ecological story of competition and predation and so on. There's this signature of the ancient activity. Now, the research that we did began, though, from a purely ecological perspective. We um, did experiments to detect whether or not there's strong present day competition between the lizard species and these islands. And we back up here and say, I should say that there are quite a few endemic lizard species on Puerto Rico and the other greater Antilles. But on each of the lesser Antilles here, there's only one species or two species of endemic anoles. And so it's been a case study for this, a case system for the study of character displacement because on the islands with two species, both body sizes are displaced from the body size on the solitary island. So if the island has one species, the snout vent length of a lizard is about 60 millimeters. If there are two species on the island, one is about 40 and the other is about 70. And so this has led to uh, a lot of conjecture that there might be character displacement going on on these islands, which has led to the difference in body size in the two species islands. And because this is on a bunch of islands, you get potentially replicated instances of the character displacement process. So this has motivated a lot of the work here. But of course, if there is competition, then if you're going to make a theory about competition, you have to know that competition occurs. So this was uh, in the 70s, and a number of us in community ecology were involved with experimental studies to detect competition. And Jim Brown did a lot of this sort of work with uh, desert rodents at the same time. Now you can see right here the outline of a little enclosure, and here's another enclosure right here. And we had seven, we had eight of these, four of them on St. Martin, four of them in the same station. Here's the ocean out over here. And so what you do with these enclosures is you uh, remove the lizards that are in it, and then you stock it with different densities of lizards, and then you catch them, and then you see how well lizards grow in the presence or absence of a presumed competitor. And with this methodology, we showed that lizards do, in fact, strongly compete for food for, for insects, and that the strength of the competition depends on how similar the body sizes are. If you stock one of these enclosures with two species that are very similar in body size, they have quite a bit of competitive effect on each other. 
whereas if they have quite a difference in body size, then the competitive effects much less. And that was the first experimental demonstration that there was a difference, experimental demonstration of the assumption that there was a difference in competition that depended on difference in body size. And so we did those enclosures. We did further introductions to offshore keys, uh, also to study competition. And um, and then since these uh, the theories in the wind had to do with whether there was any um, any change in body size, we tried to and and did um, find some sites at which to excavate fossils. So this is the island of Anguilla, where that picture was from of the lizard. And this is a, a, a limestone um, platform here. And along these limestone cliffs, there are a bunch of caves. And we found one cave, which we then excavated. Fortunately, we had someone in our group at that time who had had training uh, in uh, anthropology and knew how to take, knew how to do an excavation uh, down about uh, two meters in nice little narrow layers. And so we were able to find fossil knolls, and, um, and this is the uh, depth chart. It went down five feet in these different layers right here. And um, the horizontal axis right here indicates the approximate snout vent length corresponding to the fossil. Now, in here you find lots of kinds of bones, but if you, if you get the jawbone in particular, you can measure the length of the jawbone and then do a regression of jawbone length against the stamp vent length to come up with a pretty good assay. And it's, what we found was that the, the, um, body, the body sizes got bigger and then got smaller. Now, um, it's not quite clear what that means. The, uh, today, there is one lizard species on, on, on Anguilla. And its size is 60 millimeters, a solitary size. In historical time, there was a second species there as well. So there were clearly two species somewhere in this neck of the woods. And I should have said that this is carbon dated to 10,000 years down here. And, um, uh, and one of the, and I'll come to this in a second, this is being still worked on, the, the, the specimens we took here, and so there's a five, there's now also a 5,000 year uh, uh, dating in this neck of the woods, too. So, what this could indicate right here is that we had the smaller species, which is now extinct, then we had the larger species invade, and then the larger species become smaller after the smaller one goes extinct. Another possibility is that, that there was character displacement and that there were two species present, and this is simply getting bigger relative to the other one. But then you have to invoke some other explanation, such as climate change or something, which would account for it's getting smaller. So the upshot of this is that we have more data, but the situation isn't resolved. And I'm happy to say that there's more information coming on it, because when I left Stanford in 2010, there was a student uh, with Liz Hadley, who's a paleoecologist, who wanted to work on this. And so She's been uh, working on it and extracting fossil DNA from these specimens. And, uh, and I anticipate that a paper will be coming out from this series um, in about a year. She's nearly done with her PhD. And I just got an update from her this week. On the other hand, uh, if you consider longer history beyond the paleoecology but into the plate tectonic scale, if you look at the distribution of lineages in the Eastern Caribbean, you have one whole lineage right here, which is the Puerto Rican one. It comes down to this thing. It comes based down here. Another one which occurs in the middle half of the Lesser Antilles, from Anguilla down to um, Guadalupe. And these, as a, as a tree or as a clay, nest with the Puerto Rican ones. And then in the southern part of the Lesser Antilles, uh, from uh, Martinique uh, down through Grenada and wrapping around to Bonaire and Curaçao, you get another whole lineage whose closest relatives are actually on the Pacific coast of Mexico, which relates then, which then ties into the early Pacific origin of the Caribbean plate. 
And um, so this has then led to uh, our account of the geologic origin of the Caribbean, based, if you will, on the, uh, um, the phylogeny of, of the clay grain of lizards. And so that you find the northern half of the Lesser Antilles and Puerto Rico migrating into the Caribbean area as one unit. And then you find the southern half of the Lesser Antilles being a separate unit right here. And they both come in separately because their differentiation from each other must have occurred back when the uh, plate was in the, in the Pacific. So this goes back quite a ways. Now, what's interesting is that when this plate goes uh, eastward along the side, along the, the north coast of Venezuela, it, I think of it as like a snow plow or a plow which just uh, picks up exogenous terrains as it goes along. So that you wind up, if you've ever looked at a snow mound, a, a pile of snow in front of a snow plow, you find pieces of rocks and stuff stuck in it as it moves along. Well, I think that's what's going on here, especially in the southern Lesser Antilles, because there's a lot of suspicion of exotic terrains down here. So that's uh, a picture that you get for uh, the anoles the of the Caribbean. It starts out by being a nice, uh, comfortable story about strong present-day competition between animals, which is detectable as an ecological phenomenon. But the whole system uh, pretty much turns into a historical inquiry once you get going on it, because uh, the impact of history. So, uh, as this was wrapping up here at this point, and I'm not a paleontologist, I don't really even feel like I could continue this work myself all that much farther, and I felt that I, I'd done pretty much what I could in the system. Um, uh, an another issue at the same time as getting that feeling was that we were getting a lot of criticism about the research in the oldest by people who said that this was just a, uh, a model system and that anything we found wasn't important because it happened only on, with the oldest lizards in the Caribbean. You know? and so, so you could find anything you wanted to know about an oldest lizard, but it didn't matter. And so I thought I would switch to a system where um, it was a big system and there was a lot of broad interest into it. So that's what led me to start research in the Rocky Intertidal Zone off of California, because after all, it's a big system, a lot of people care about it, and there's a lot of inherent interest in it. And so I began research at the Hopkins Marine Station in Monterey. And this is a picture of um, the uh, rocks right outside, if you sit on the picnic bench right there at the Marine Station's lawn. This is the set of rocks that you see, which are called bird rock because of the bird hawk. Now, uh, our research in this system really took, uh, I guess you could say, three phases. The first, of, first of all, we focused on very small scale, then medium scale, and then large scale phenomena. So at the small scale, uh, what we did was we built a system of pipes right here throughout the inner tidal zone. And uh, we pumped water in at high tide um, to uh, look at the water and to see what kind of uh, larvae particularly were in them. The, what was at issue at the time was what explains the spatial distribution in the Rocky Intertidal Zone of community structure. Because there are a lot more animals out here uh, than there are in here. And the typical explanations in the wind at the time were that uh, the local ecology, that is the meter by meter scale ecology in the Rocky Intertidal Zone was set by two things, uh, by uh, desiccation resistance, um, and so the supposition is that it's very hot here uh, where there isn't a lot of wave action, and so that's hard on some barnacles, and down here it's maybe cooler, so there'd be this focus on a uh, microclimate, and then also uh, focus on the access to predators. So if there's a starfish lurking around, and the starfish will come and eat you up and leave a lot of vacant space. And so some of the vacant space would be explained by uh, starfish predation, or predation by anything, but especially starfish. So you get this picture of local distribution of community structure being determined by local process, mainly uh, desiccation or predation. And then also they compete with one another for space, and so you have that as an additional process. Now what we did with this, though, is we showed that 
the uh, distribution of uh, barnacles in the area was really determined by the settlement rate that was coming into the rock. So we implicated settlement rate as a factor, as are more important than predation or um, desiccation or competition to determine abundance. So let me show you uh, a set of four slides from what happens at a, at a location, a spot out here, where there's a lot of settlement, and then show you another set of two slides from a spot where there's low settlement. So you can see a high settlement site rock and a low settlement rock. So uh, here's a little spot right here. These little uh, white areas are the these polygons are the ghosts of uh, barnacles past. Here's, a, here's some barnacles. And uh, there's some little specks here, which are uh, cyprids that have just landed. So then, uh, uh, two weeks later, those little cyprids are starting to get big and grow up. And then we get uh, a starfish that comes along and eats the big barnacles over here. Meanwhile, these guys are growing nice and big. And then after that, they get nailed. And so what you do is you see in these high settlement locations this uh, uh, role of predation and opening up vacant space. But the only reason the starfish is there is that there's high settlement to get you lots of barnacles to attract them. So the starfish are not the cause of the vacant space, they're the consequence of the high settlement. In contrast, you go to a low settlement location in the same, over the same time, and, and here's what there is, some vacant space, here's a barnacle, and here's some algae. And, uh, uh, and then in the same length of time, this barnacle got a little bit bigger, the algae got a little bit bigger, and that's about it. Here's a Limpet, another limpet that came into view. So, so, so the absence of, of anything going on here has nothing to do with the predator. It has to do with the fact that there's low settlement. And then there's low settlement, there's no action. So, what the conclusion from my lab was is that the main determinant, we would say the main determinant, of local heterogeneity in community structure is settlement local access to the water column that is bearing larvae. Now, from that scale, we kind of branched out a bit. Um, if settlement is so important, the question arises as to what determines settlement. So we had a field stations set up out on the coast um, in a place called Granite Canyon. And, uh, and I should have said, perhaps, that, Mon that Hopkins Marine Station, where I took those data to show you was on Monterey Bay in Southern California. And Grand Canyon is a station that's just facing the open ocean. Now, um, notice that there are episodes in here. There, uh, the hatched in areas are times when the water right adjacent to the coast has high salinity, uh, uh, sorry, high temperature. Sea surface temperature here, high temperature, high temperature. These are high temperature times, and they're coincident with low salinity. So we have the arrival on the coast of high temperature, low salinity water, and those correspond with um, periods of recruitment. Right here, high recruitment. So we have this, and we have lots of, had, you know, over the years, got lots of data of this sort, but you find this uh, nearly perfect correlation between the arrival of, against the coast of hot, fresh water with settlement. Now, uh, so that led us to inquire what's, what's going on. Now here's, Hop here's uh, Monterey Bay and Hopkins Marine Station. The Granite Canyon uh, site is right here, facing the open ocean. And the offshore waters from California here is the California Current System, which is largely a, a southward flowing uh, current, which is the eastern margin of the North Pacific Gyre. And there are these uh, mesoscale structures here. Um, 
And these mesoscale structures move around. So um, here it is one day, and then a day later, this whole structure moved closer to shore down here. Let me show you the difference. See, here it is out here. One day later, it's closer to shore. Now, the, the water adjacent to the coast, and the colors right here indicate temperature, the waters adjacent to the coast are cold and salty. This is recently upwell water. And then this is the warmer fresh water out here. And between the warmer, fresher water of the California current and the freshly upwell water uh, are fronts right here, a so-called upwelling front. And so our, the evidence suggested that when the upwelling front came to shore, that that's when the recruitment occurred. And these things bump up against the shore. So we, we went out to sample these upwelling fronts. And we did so initially in just a fishing boat like this. And then um, we were eventually competitive to, uh, in this work to uh, get the point served with NSF, with NSF funding. And of course, when we were doing this work, it was controversial uh, because we were trying to explain local community ecology in terms of offshore processes uh, rather than in terms of local uh, dynamics. And, uh, and then after that, we had done, after doing all the field work in, in the ocean, um, we also set up a, a large set of sites running from, this was together with Bruce Mangy's group up here, who was censusing um, off of Oregon, and my lab was monitoring these right here from Mendocino down to Point Concepcion. And so we had uh, a, a lot of data from a uh, biogeographic standpoint, as well as a mesoscale standpoint. And the bottom line from all this um, was um, a hypothesis that we, that we were working with, called, that we, we call the tattered curtain. I'm trying to make something with a catchy phrase. And so if this is the coast along here, and this is the California current, and this wiggly line is supposed to indicate uh, a current that's punctuated, a curtain or a front that's punctuated, if you will, at spots by uh, off offshore jets, offshore going jets. And our assumption, our, our hypothesis for what's going on in off of California right here is that the larvae are released along the shore. The larvae are carried offshore by um, the uh, upwelling. The upwelling is caused by so-called Ekman transport. Uh, and so it's the Ekman transport which is carrying it offshore. And when it goes offshore, it bumps up against the water from the California current and then drops. Now, when the wind relaxes, now, see, upwelling occurs, if you want to think about it this way, upwelling is caused by two things at the same time. It's caused by the earth turning. So as the earth turns, it tends to make the water, um, um, the water veer, veer off because the earth is turning in that way. So the water um, uh, veers off away from the coast. But as the, as the wind blows, the wind is also blowing it downstream. So that the net effect of the wind and the Coriolis effect is to cause for off, offshore flow, which tends to be heading south slightly southwest. And when the wind stops, uh, the upwelling stops. And when the upwelling stops, then this whole structure can migrate into shore. And when it comes into shore, it then deposits all the larvae. So that was our hypothesis, which uh, at the time accounted, I think, for pretty much the entire uh, set of data that we had. In the north, um, there's less upwelling, and so there's higher recruitment in the north, and the uh, intertidal studies in the north tended to emphasize 
local community processes, and we would say they are focusing on local uh, processes up here because of the high settlement, which then allowed things like competition and prediction to express themselves in a local dynamic. Whereas down here, when you get to Central California, you know, biogeographically, but a bit south, you're getting a lot more upwelling, so, so by and large, the recruitment's a lot less, and so therefore, community structure down here becomes more determined by oce oceanic processes than by local benthic processes. And so you get a latitudinal gradient in the relative proportion, uh, or the relative importance of offshore versus local processes. Now, amazingly enough, uh, just last month I was sent a paper by Cheryl Harrison. Um, and these folks have just published an article which basically revised, confirms and revises that theory that we put out in about 10, 15 years ago. And so you're welcome to see this. They, done a very sophisticated treatment uh, with a lot of fluid dynamics in it. And so this hypothesis seems to be uh, alive and well. But as, as, I, as this work, again, we, we did what we could with this system, I think, pretty much. And as far as I was concerned, we pretty much figured out what was going on. Um, and I became very interested in economics, primarily in connection with uh, the economics of uh, harvesting. Uh, natural resource management, and published some papers uh, with uh, Paul Armsworth on the, the connection between um, stability, ecosystem stability, and profit. Um, as you may know, the recommendation for the rate at which the, the, the economically optimal, the economically optimal rate of harvesting uh, in a constant environment is to place the stock that's being harvested at an equilibrium point, at a steady state point, which is not stable to perturbation. And so uh, I criticized that as uh, being a problem. And, and there was objection to that, of course. And so what we then did was economic analysis to show that if you were to harvest, try to harvest, a stock that was unstable at an unstable equilibrium, you'd lose money over the long run because the stock would fluctuate a whole lot. And so we showed, therefore, that you would actually maximize your profit if on an average basis you harvested less so that the stock could grow to a higher size at which it would be um, stable. So we did work in this ecological economics area, and that's what set me up for of taking an economics approach to understanding social behavior. Now this is the work I'm currently doing, uh, and it's focused on understanding uh, the economic incentives for cooperation in social groups. And here's uh, an example of a kind of process. Uh, I'll give you two examples of uh, phenomena we've been looking at. Uh, so this is called nuptial feeding right here. So this is about cooperation. And so here's uh, a, a cardinal uh, giving uh, a male cardinal, tell from the way it's colored, giving food to a female cardinal. And this happens in insects as well, where uh, a male will give a female uh, uh, a mass, which can either be uh, a secretion or uh, a bug. And there are differences between the way birds do this and the way insects do this. Uh, it's customary in this literature for the bird people and the insect people to talk about them both as being examples of the same overall phenomenon. But I, that may be fine, but I, I'm accepting that with reservation. The reason is, is that the feeding uh, with birds happens before the mating goes on, whereas the feeding with insects happens during the mating. And um, that may be okay. Uh, in any case, uh, uh, on a recent review by Lewis and Sal, 
Uh, none of the opiates are uh, quite common in nature. They're, uh, I completely accept these definitions here. None of the opiates are materials beyond the obligatory gametes that are transferred from one sex to another during courtship or puberty. <coughs> and they have a nice classification of kinds of them. So is the uh, gift itself exogenously produced, which would be true of, uh, for example, like the cardinals, which are feeding by giving Giving, giving insects or giving seeds or something? Or did they have to make, the, did the animal have to make the gift itself? Um, and then there are various kinds of species that do that. And, um, and then there's the method of delivery, do they feed them? But then there's genital delivery, which is where the gift is part of, bundled into the seminal fluid proteins or spermatophores. And then there's the so-called transdermal delivery, which is where the um, gift, so to speak, is actually injected through the uh, skin. So this would be for subterranean animals uh, to a large extent, like earthworms. So all of these different species have um, um, behaviors in which there is some amount of uh, food or material that's given by the male to the female. Now there's information about this. So uh, there's the male's contribution to the female and the female's contribution to the male. So I haven't found a species for which there's a complete data set where all the angles are covered. So I wound up having to take data from different species and sort of to try to make a synthetic picture. So the horizontal axis here is the number of salivary masses consumed. So, so if the female eats more salivary masses, the vertical axis here is the number of eggs produced. So the female in this species makes more eggs with the food she's given. Now this isn't necessarily true in all species, but in some of them it is true. Now what does the female give the male? Well, the female gives the male the size of the nuptial gift, and this is the duration of copulation. So the bigger the gift that the male gives, the longer the female lets him copulate. And on this axis here, we have duration of copulation in minutes. This is quite a long time here, up to an hour, hour and a half. And then it's fertilization rate. So the male uh, gets a higher fertilization rate from, from the female. So the female controls this. So the male, of course, controls how much he gives to the female. And the female controls how much he, she gives the male for what she just got. Okay? So that's the setup. So this is called, or could be called, a principal agent problem in economics, where the principal is somebody who owns a company. <clears throat> like, like so you have, you're going to start, you're going to be a startup, you're going to have a company. You're going to hire somebody. So you, if you, <coughs> excuse me, if you start the, the company, you're called the principal, and your employee is called the agent. And so the, what economists have worried about is what the optimal compensation rate is. So if you're an employer, how much should you pay your employee to keep your employee happy? And then your employer, your employee, has to decide whether or not to act on your behalf or to go and freelance. And so the basic, this is the most, in many sense, the most elementary problem in the so-called theory of the firm in economics, is how to figure out the optimal relationship between the employer and the employee. And in our case right here, the female is in effect the employer, the principal. She's the one who controls <coughs> the eggs. And so she's going to hire, hire the male to go get food for her. And so she, the question then of interest here is how much should the female give the male in terms of compensation? for what's being done. How much should the male give to the female? 
And so this is uh, the typical formula being used uh, in this area in uh, the theory of the firm with respect to the principal agent model. So I've just kind of sketched it out here for a male and a female. And the, left, the WF right here stands for the fitness increment that the female earns a day. Now, so I should make it clear, this is not a population genetic model. This is a behavioral model. And so what I'm doing here is imagine that in any given day, the male and the female adjust their behavior so that they produce the largest fitness increment during that day. And then the next day, they behave however they should and make another fitness increment. And then when you get the fitness increments over the lifespan, that's where you get the genetic fitness that you'd use in an evolutionary argument. So this is being done at a scale underneath the population genetic scale. This is the behavioral time scale. We're doing day-to-day -day, uh, behavior. So this would be the fitness increment of the female, and it's due to the, to the, to the nuptial gift and the courtship feeding. So operationally, I've distinguished here between a nuptial gift, which is food given by the male to the female prior to any mating taking place, and courtship feeding as food being given while the mating is taking place. And the reason for drawing the distinction right here is that the economists, and I think it's a good idea, the, the economists distinguish between what you pay to join the company. Uh, for example, if you were going to start your own little McDonald's, you might have to pay a franchise fee up front, just in order to get in. And then you'd pay every year based on what you earn. So that's a pay to play. And that can be positive in the case of you pay to play, or if you need to join a club. I, uh, in the, a golf club or something. You pay an initiation fee, and then you pay monthly for services rendered. But you pay the initiation fee to get in. That's what the nuptial gift is. It's the initiation fee. You pay it up front, and then once you do that, you can, you can play. Uh, but that could be negative, the, the nuptial gift, because in the case of football teams, they pay the player uh, a bonus. So a signing bonus would be a negative nuptial gift. So this thing right here can be either sign. But the compensation, so this is what, this is what the, the, uh, the male gives to the female. Um, that's the food she's getting while she's mating. And then this is what she pays for it. So C is what she's getting. N is how much she gives the male per unit food she gets. And WF, is happens to be how much her so called outside option, how much food she can get on her own just by herself. And the male's fitness, on the other hand, is what he's paid. So you see it's positive here and negative there. And this is just a constant proportionality. This is what it cost him to get the food, to get the, um, um, the courtship feeding. And this is what it cost him for the ability to give. And if he gets this for playing, if that exceeds what he could do by himself, which is his outside option, then he should play. But if, if by cooperating with the female, he doesn't do any better than he would on his own, then he shouldn't even, he shouldn't even bother. So this is the setup for uh, a principal agent model. And I'm trying to uh, uh, integrate this now with data and, uh, and work on some of the assumptions now, the predictions of a model like that are quite interesting, though. Um, and if you, you can draw it as a graph like this. The horizontal axis is the male fitness gain. The vertical axis is the female fitness gain. And ask, OK, they're going to they're gonna have a certain amount of which one gives to the other and the other gives back. This is a gain here, a so-called gain in mathematics, because the female is trying to optimize this. The male is trying to optimize this. And by definition, mathematicians say that when you have two interacting parties who are trying to optimize each with the other, that's called a game.
So this is a particular case of the game right here. And if both parties are trying to uh, maximize their respective goals right here, they can do it in two ways. They can compete. So one can try to do the best it can, given what the other does. And the other can try to do its best, given what the first does. That's called a Nash equilibrium. And it's one kind of outcome for a game. And that's a competitive outcome. On the other hand, they don't have to. We're talking behavior now, we're not talking about gene pools. They don't have to compete. What they could do is make a deal. And they could make a deal in which both of if they make a deal, there are a lot of deals that are win-win deals for both of them. And so if they ratchet up how much courtship feeding there is, and how much the nuptial gift is, and what the rate uh, of uh, a pay, a return payment is. If they ratchet these up, it winds up being a win-win solution for both of them. And you can even compute the best win-win solution. So this line out here are, is the curve of all the win-win solutions. This is what they would wind up with, uh, you know, a lower fitness gain for both if they compete with each other. But if they cooperate with, with each other, then they ought to wind up out here. And so the question that arises as to whether they actually are capable of negotiating and coming to win-win solutions, which is an empirical question. So I don't know the answer to that. But there certainly would be a strong selection pressure for that capability. Now, um, another type of a, a principle of a firm that, that I'd be looking into is in connection with the parent-offspring interaction. And here the analogy is to the kind of firm called a conglomerate in economics, where there's a holding company and then there, there are subsidiaries. And what you can think of right here is that a parent is like a holding company, so to speak, for its offspring. And a parent earn, earns its fitness because of the fitness of its offspring. So you think of um, something like McDonald's, for example. How does McDonald's make its profit? It makes its profit from the profit made of all this, by all the subordinates. Well, this is the same sort of thing here. We have the parent, and you have lots of offspring, and it's the offspring that are producing fitness for the parent. And so you can compute, therefore, from the theory of the firm, just how much food the parent should give the offspring, and when the parent should wean the offspring, and conversely, how much the offspring should be demanding from the parent. And you can compute this in this kind of model, uh, assuming the parent and the offspring compete or cooperate. Again, you have those two possibilities. And so this addresses the long-standing issue of parent-offspring conflict, as to whether parent-offspring conflict actually is genuine, and uh, uh, whether Um, so I've made a table of all the different sorts of companies, of all, all the sorts of issues that the economic theory of the firm uh, has addressed over the years. And now we can't use these models directly in biology, but they're very in interesting to read because they concern, uh, there's a huge literature in economics about the limits to the size of the firm which is analogous to our discussions about what limits the size of the social group. How big should social group be? When should somebody enter? When should somebody leave? The employee management relationship right here, which is what I was just talking about. Tactics to reduce freeloading. And uh, there's an interesting discussion in the literature about firms versus a producer coalition. A producer coalition would be uh, sort of a, a transient cooperative relationship, uh, where you've seen, for example, mis mixed species um, feeding flocks underwater if you've been snorkeling and you see sometimes a, I guess a parrotfish and a goatfish or something else, you know, they're swimming along together, you get a mixed species school, and they're, they're not a long-lasting association, they just sort of come together, work together, and then go apart. That's the idea of a producer coalition, whereas a firm is more of a long-lived entity. And um, um, not a mutualism exactly, well it could be, I guess. Um, but it's one where 
both parties have a long-term relationship with one another, which is not altruistic, it's cooperative. Each has been involved in a beneficial mutual transaction. So <clears throat> there are discussions about when uh, something like a mixed species school should transition into a more permanent relationship among them or not. And you get uh, uh, you know, interspecies cooperations, which of course occur in Carl Reitz all over the place and are really interesting. So, uh, so finally, what I'd like to do very shamelessly just give you some commercial messages here. Um, Evolution's Rainbow, uh, a book I published in 2004, is uh, in Portuguese and uh, translated into Korean and just came out in the 10th year anniversary. The Genio Gene, which I published in 2009, is now out in French. And now here's the ultimate self indulgence This is the book I've just finished, my first novel. <laughs> so this is a, a, a retelling of the Ramayana set in the year 2050, sort of science fiction. So, uh, glad that was fun. <laughs> All right, so um, I know this is kind of a whirlwind thing, but hopefully it's helpful to get this overview of what I've done to. So thanks a lot.